Amen. Good morning. Welcome to Burns Memorial United Methodist Church on this first day of spring. I thought you should have a happy picture of jumping up and kicking your feet. Years ago, the boys and I were up on Stone Mountain, and we jumped up. It took us four or five tries, but we finally got all of our feet up in the air at the same time. Happy first day of spring. Welcome here. It looks like a lot of our folks went to the lake today or the beach or something, but uh, we're happy you all made it. And, and uh, Cornelius and Thomas here coming in. Welcome. Our call to worship is from Psalm 63, a selection of verses. I'll read the light print if you all read the dark print together. Let's stand, please. <coughs> O oh God, you are my God. I earnestly search for you. Your unfailing love is better than life itself. I praise you. I will praise you as long as I live, lifting up my hands to you in prayer. Because you are my helper, I will sing for joy in the shadow of your wings. I cling to you. Your strong right hand hold me secure. Amen. Let us pray. Dear Lord, we do indeed cling to you and praise your name and celebrate your love and constant goodness toward us this morning. We're thankful, Lord, for this day and indeed for this breath, for every day that you give us. We're thankful for the coming again of spring and all the hope that comes with spring, the, the, the flowers blooming and new life arriving. And we're thankful, Lord, for spring and the life of the church and we ask that you help us to break out and continue to grow and, and show your love in our community. Bless us, dear Lord, as we worship you and celebrate you this morning. In your name we gather, in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. That must be the spring in y'all this morning. I like that. That was good. Everybody was there. Good, good, good. And as you remain standing, would you join us as we sing, Morning Has Broken. As you remain standing, we're going to do something different today. As you remain standing, we're going today do the affirmation of faith. Deer's Cry, written by St. Patrick. So, let us unite in this ancient Irish affirmation of faith. I rise today with power of God to guide me, the might of God to uphold the wisdom of God to teach me, the eye of God to watch over me, the ear of God to hear me, the word of God to give me speech, the hand of God to protect me, the path of God to lie before me, the shield of God to shelter me, the host of God to defend me against the snares of the devil, 
and the temptations of the world against every man who meditates in injury against me, whether far or near. Amen. Glory be to the Father and to the Son. taking your seat, you can reach across the aisle and smile and shake hands with two or three people, somebody you haven't spoken to yet today. The events for the week are as follows. We have the Monday Movers as usual. But Tuesday, pay, pay close attention, particularly on Tuesday, it's a very heavy day. We have the prayer vac uh, breakfast, the community prayer breakfast this year for this month is uh, being hosted by the Vineyard of Augusta on Parish Road. All are invited to enjoy a time of prayer and fellowship. So if you're interested, that's Tuesday at eight o'clock. Augusta Gardens is back on our schedule now. Uh, the movers, once again, the uh, morning movers. The Augusta Exchange Club will be meeting, but their guest speaker will be uh, Brigadier General Stanton from Fort Gordon. His wife will be their guest speaker for that. So if you have time on Tuesday, about 12 noon, and you want to attend, Please do. The Latain Kirkley Circle, one o'clock. And on Thursday, the importance, other than Monday Movers, is the Finance Committee. And they'll meet at six o'clock on Thursday. Let me call your attention to the inserts today. You have a, a yellow one, place a lily on the cross. This is a, uh, uh, an event that's sponsored through the uh, Fellowship Sunday School class to help support uh, mission projects. And it's called Placing a Lily on the Cross. Lilies may be designated in honor or memory of someone. It's special to you by completing the form and you can see the, the different categories there. The, uh, the, the, the deadline is April 10th and it's $2 per person that you want to remember or, or put this in honor of and just mark your your check in the memo section with lilies on the cross. Also the insert, and there's more details here if you, if you read it over. The uh, other insert is about lunch on Easter. Anyone like ham here? We, uh, a lot of, a lot of, uh, we've had a lot of good hams in the past and I look forward to this year's smoked ham for Easter. The Methodist men are cooking them again, 10 to 12 pound ham for $50 and the deadline uh, to order is April 10th, and you pick them up on Friday 
on Good Friday, April 15th from 10 a.m. to noon. I think that's it. God is good. And all the time. And if you'll remain seated and join us as we sing, Be Thou My Vision. Be Thou My Vision, O Lord of my heart. Not be enough to me, save that Thou The hymn we just sang, Be Thou My Vision, as well as the, the creed we use today, Deer's Cry, go back to the early days. It was being organized and put together in the Mediterranean churches by the Roman Catholics and Orthodox working together. Patrick on Ireland was uh, composing the Deer's Cry, and the early Irish were singing, uh, Be Thou My Vision. In, in the Gaelic, when we sing that, I like to try to sing it with an Irish lint, uh, you know, pretend to be Irish as we sing it. The Irish of uh, St. Patrick's was last Thursday. You know, it's a Christian holiday. He's a Christian missionary and just a fabulous story. He was captured by the, the British or uh, uh, English person, captured by the uh, Irish pirates who knew there were such but captured by them and, and then taken to Ireland and kept as a slave for years. Finally, uh, is told by God that his ship has come in, and so he flees to the coast and gets a ride back and finds his way back to his family and, and uh, after a while goes into the ministry and the priesthood and then feels called by God to go back to Ireland. And so uh, he lives, spends the rest of his life in ministry to those who had imprisoned him. And I, I think that's a great example of loving your enemies and, and doing good to those who have persecuted you. So we like to remember it with a little bit every year uh, with, the, with our only Irish hymn and, and the deer's cry. Before we pray together, just call your attention to a couple uh, church needs. Gary Green isn't with us this morning. He's at University Hospital. He's having uh, respiratory challenges and, and uh, heart challenges, and they think he's gonna be released later today uh, once his rhythm gets uh, uh, back in order and uh, uh, once he has the home oxygen taken care of but he's having some health challenges remember him in your prayers and thoughts and, and he likes to talk on the phone too so when he's back home he might enjoy some of your phone calls and we have other church members who are recovering from illnesses at home and, and if you don't see somebody here they might not be on vacation so just think about your friends who aren't here today and, and pray for them as well let's bow our heads and pray together Heavenly Father, we pause now in our worship service and are mindful that all of our blessings come from you. We're thankful, Lord, for friends and for family, for those whom we love and are able to gather with on special occasions. Lord, we're grateful for the many ways you bless us and the, the breath of life and just enjoying this wonderful world that you have made. Heavenly Father, our hearts go out to those who can't be with us today for health reasons and we just lift them up and ask that you bless them where they are. We pray that you help them, help their health to be restored and their strength to return. And Lord, we lift them up and ask that you bless them and keep them and strengthen them. We pray especially for Gary as he recovers at the hospital. 
that he might find the healing help that he needs and be able to return home soon. Dear Lord, we continue to lift up the people of Ukraine and the people of Russia and, and the people of that part of, of Europe. Lord, that they might have peace and that you might raise up leaders, leaders there and leaders here who can find a way to, uh, to work for peace in that land. Lord, we lift them up. We ask your blessings upon them. We pray, Heavenly Father, lastly, for our continuing ministry here at Burns, that you might help us in 2022 to grow in our love of you and our love for our community and our love for each other. We lift up all of our prayers in the name of the Christ, the one who taught us to pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Of my soul. Pray.
Sometimes when people love you, they have to say tough things. You ever heard that before? The concept of tough love? And they don't do it because they're mean. They do it because they love you and they want you to hear some things. Jesus does that from time to time, and he, he does it in our reading today. We'll get to it in just a minute from Luke 13. <clears throat> he makes statements that sound a little bit hard, a little bit harsh, but I think he's making the statement out of love, out of love for his followers. It's good to have people in your world who can give you a little bit of tough love. Years ago, I was visiting my, my folks in Atlanta, I might have shared this one time, and my mother said to me, no warning at all, she said, stick out your finger, John, and, and she had one of these little plastic devices and reached over to my finger and, and snap, and a needle popped out and, and it made the end of my finger bleed. And my mother's a retired nurse and she had this little home cholesterol kit, and so she took my finger and squeezed a little bit in this little, little uh, device and shook it up and said, I'll explain it in a minute. And she uh, shook it up and then she said, I was checking your cholesterol level. You're okay now, but you need to get more exercise. I mean, that's love. Who, who, who other than somebody who loves you would do something like that? I'm sorry, mom, I probably shouldn't have shared that story. <laughs> Let's stand for the, for the reading of God's word. Luke chapter 13, verses one through nine. There were present at that season some who told, G, told him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And Jesus answered and said to them, Do you suppose that those Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered such things? I tell you, no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Or of those 18 on whom the tower in Siloam fell and killed, do you think they were worse sinners than all the other men who dwelt in Jerusalem? I tell you, no. No, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. He also spoke to them this parable. A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came seeking fruit on it and found none. Then he said to the keeper of the vineyard, look, for three years I've come looking for fruit on this fig tree and found none. Cut it down. Why use up the ground? But his gardener answered and said to him, Sir, let it alone for this year also, and I'll dig around it and fertilize it. And if it bears fruit, well, but if not, after that, you can cut it down. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Please be seated. According to the Gospel of Luke, Jesus was on his way down to Jerusalem from Galilee. It's about an 80 mile journey. Galilee on the top of the screen, Lake, uh, the Sea of Galilee, Lake Kinneseret on Israel's maps today, and Jerusalem down there at the bottom. About an 80, 80 mile journey, maybe an eight day hike, depending on uh, what, eight miles a day, maybe 11, 11 day hike if they took the Sabbath off. Some, somewhere along the way, on this walk to Jerusalem, some unnamed people came to Jesus and told, and his disciples, and told them about these two nasty disasters that apparently had happened recently. The first disaster, the notorious Pontius Pilate, who had been ruling Israel for, for four years, had been a monstrously cruel ruler and had put down riots viciously. This Pontius Pilate had mixed the blood of Galileans he had executed with the blood of Jewish sacrifices. And it was offensive and disgusting and revolting and sickening and all these things. And as appalling as all this is, he, he, he did all this somewhere on the temple grounds and, 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 and had to quell a revolt as a result of all this. Now Jesus had the ability to read minds and he knew what they were thinking. So he says to you, I know some of you are thinking, I know that you're thinking that these Galileans who were killed and had their blood mixed with the sacrifices were worse sinners than everybody else. Isn't that right? Aren't you thinking that way? Then he says, I want to be clear to you, it's not the case. Just because these people suffer a horrible death like this, it doesn't mean they're any bigger sinners than anybody else. That's just not the case. 
Rather, Jesus is saying that when you die suddenly and abruptly like this, tragically and brutally, as these Galileans did, it's time when you see this kind of event happen, and we all know people who've died tragically and suddenly, it's time for you to think about your own life, how you are living your own life. In other words, these tragedies ought to be reminders to us of our own mortality, that we too might come to an unexpected and sudden ending. And, uh, and how are we? How is our soul with God? Are we ready like these Galileans had to be to face Jesus today? Are we ready to meet God face to face? How are we living out our love for God and our love for other people? Jesus is saying, while there is still time, repent and turn your lives around. Trust God and follow. You know, sometimes you talk about the still, small voice of God. It sounds like Jesus is talking with a bullhorn here. He's getting everybody's attention loud and clear. And just to make the point doubly clear, Jesus continues, you heard about the tragic news of the 18 people who were killed in Jerusalem when a tower fell over near the pool of Siloam, just south of Jerusalem. That was awful. Talk about a disaster. 18 people, men, women, and children killed when that tower fell over. Did these people tragically deserve it? They died in that way. Did they somehow have it coming? No, of course not, Jesus says again. They died in that moment, in that, in that, in that moment in time, died unexpectedly. And they were not worse sinners than anybody else. And Jesus' point here is that we all need to be ready at any moment. And again, the question that comes up, are you ready? Are you ready? Jesus then tells them a parable to even make it more clear. He tells them this parable of the fig tree. He says, a, a man planted a fig tree and he came looking for fruit off that fig tree for three straight years, still no fruit. And he comes looking and finally tells his gardener in exasperation, cut it down, plant something else. It's taking up good space here. We need something that will produce. And the gardener, of course, says, give it another year. I'll dig around and fertilize it and love on it. And maybe this year we'll get some figs. If not, we'll cut it down. That's the gospel reading for today. And, and as I said, I, I think this would count among the hard sayings, among the, the tough love of Jesus to his disciples then and today. So what's the message for us from, from these accounts, from these tragic stories and, and from Jesus' parable? I think first off, it's a message that we shape our own futures, that our decisions shape our, our futures, that there's a sense in which we, we write the outcome of our stories. You need to know how different this is. In, in the ancient world, they were most of the world around, the, the, around Jews, most of the world was dominated by belief in fate, in fatalism, that everything was predetermined the name for fate was, fate was Mori, and the root word comes from lots. And it isn't in the sense that you're casting lots and gambling. Rather, it, rather, it's in the sense that this is your lot, and that's all you got. And, and the root word comes from a cut of meat. Seriously, it's as if your lot is to have this cut of meat. And so you may want a good cut of meat from the, from the, from the Boston butt shoulder part, but you get a pig ear or, or a pig foot. That's your lot in life, and you can't change it. That's your fate. I was looking at this, and it occurred to me that's what it means to live high on the hog. You get the good cuts on top and not the feet or the tail or the ears. But the concept of fate was that whatever it is that life had dealt you, the butcher shop of life had dealt you, that's what you got, and you can't change it. And so if you have a pig ear and you want, you want a better cut, you can't do anything about it, that's your lot. That's your fate. If you got the pig's foot, that's, you just make a soup or something. Deal with it. That's what you do with it. That was the worldview, and there were plays written about that worldview. Sophocles, a Greek playwright, wrote a story about fate 400 years before the time of Jesus called Oedipus the king. And it's a tragic story. Probably a number of y'all read this in school or, or since. A story about a proud king and young wife who have a son. And the oracle says, fate says, that the son's going to grow up to kill his father and marry his mother. 
And so the proud king says, this can't happen. And so he gives the son to a, a servant, tells him, take him in the woods and get rid of him. The servant adopts him instead and, and, and raises him not knowing who he is, that he's the son of the king. And the son grows up and he becomes a strong and proud person too. And, and as an adult, he meets his father, the king, not knowing who he is. They come to an intersection of the road and they get into an argument. Son kills the father, goes into Thebes, I think the city is, and ends up marrying the mother. Fate wins. Fate wins. You see echoes of that belief in our world today, I think, when people say that DNA tells us all of who we are or that our environment, our neighborhood, our schools, whatever, our influences shape everything about us. But of course, this modern belief in fate has no explanation for identical twins, same DNA, but totally different worldview and totally different way of life, or, or two people growing up in the same neighborhood and one becoming a saint and the other a villain. Fatalism doesn't explain reality. But fatalism was dominant in the ancient Middle East, except among the Jews and among the Christians. The Jewish view was that God had created us so that we could follow and choose God and that our fate was up to us. There's this great passage from the book of Ezekiel where God is talking to the prophet Ezekiel and he says, suppose a righteous man does what is just and right. And paraphrasing, he, he doesn't worship idols, worship idols. He doesn't sleep with his neighbor's spouse. He doesn't oppress the poor, rob or steal, etc. but is generous and faithful. Will he not live? says the Lord, surely he will. But suppose he has a son who's just the opposite, who murders, who worships idols, who commits adultery, oppresses the poor, etc. Will such a man live? Of course not. His blood is on his own head. But suppose that son, Ezekiel, the Lord speaking to Ezekiel continues, suppose that son has a son who sees the sins of his father, and though he sees them, he chooses a different way. Instead, he keeps God's laws and follows his decrees like his grandfather, will he not die? Will he die for his father's sins? No, of course not. He will live because of his own choices. Friends, that's a radical passage. A strong focus on free will and on individualism that we can choose. We can make decisions that shape our fate. Amen. Jeremiah, the prophet, picks up on that same theme and says, Stand in the ways and see and ask for the old paths where the good way is, and walk in it, and then you will find rest for your souls. Again, so there's this, this idea that you can choose your fate. The Hebrew word for road, by the way, is the word derek, and originally Hebrew letters were like Egyptian hieroglyphics. They had pictures to them, and so the word picture for derek, for the way, or the road you choose, is a picture of a door that you're opening as if you choose to open a door and that becomes your path and your way. Jesus picks up on the same thing as he finishes the Sermon on the Mount when he says, enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go in by it, but narrow is the gate and difficult is the way that leads to life. And there are few who find it. Jesus' last parable in the Sermon on the Mount is this, he says, whoever hears these, my, these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to the man who built his house on the rock and the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house and it did not fall because it's founded on the rock. But everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house in the sand and the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house and it fell and great was its fall. Again, Jesus' emphasis on the importance of the choices we make, that our choices shape our destiny. Secondly, I think the, 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 the passage today is about free will and about choices. Secondly, it's a story about God's wanting fruit and God being patient. Let's go back to the parable for a minute. Uh, you all know if you grow an apple tree, you want it to produce what? Apples. If you grow a pear tree, you want it to produce pears. If you grow a cherry tree, you want some cherries. And so if you grow a fig tree, what are you looking for? Figs, that's right. 
And if a tree doesn't produce fruit, eventually, if the land is viable and, and a big effort, you cut it down and put something else there with hopes that maybe that will bear fruit. The parable is about patience. The, the uh, owner is all, all ready to cut it down, but the gardener says, hang on a moment. Let's give this tree one more chance, one more time, more space, one more year, some, some more manure, some love and, and good water, and maybe this tree will bear fruit this year. It's about patience, about God giving us more time, one more chance, one more season, one more year, one more space to, to find the will of God and follow the will of God in our lives. And I think that's one of the reasons Jesus is telling this story to his disciples then and now. He's reminding them that God has dreams for us and, and we haven't yet fulfilled what he wants, but he's patient, he's waiting, he's looking for us to respond. There's a musical out some years ago called Les Mis. And there's a song in that musical, One Day More, in which Vow in which they, they all take turns singing. Everybody, all the different people who are in the, in the musical all seem to be longing for one day more. And, and Val Jean Val Val says, tomorrow we'll be far away. He's got his plans to leave. Tomorrow will be judgment day. And all the people in the chorus refrain sings, tomorrow we'll discover what our God in heaven has in store. One more dawn, one more day, one more day, the song goes on. Friends, I think this is a hopeful parable because God is, is holding out hope for us that given time, like that fig tree, that given time will respond to the love and grace of God. Amen. But as the scholar Matthew Henry writes about this passage, he says, great and long suffering is the patience of God. Yet eventually he executes judgment and the patience of God doesn't go on forever. So my last observation, the first is that it's a, it's a story about choices. Second, it's a story about God wanting fruit. And, and, and you might say, what kind of fruit does God want? Well, Jesus laid it out in the commandments. He said that you should love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, and with all your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. That's what the Lord is looking for, looking for internal, internal change lived out in our life. John writes in his uh, letters, he says, how can you say that you love God while you hate your neighbor? Uh, you, you can't say it and live this way. He's saying you have to be authentic. So that's what the Lord is looking for us, authentic, authentic fruit of loving God and loving other people. That's the fruit he's looking for. So it's about choices and it's about this longing for God to see us make progress. And lastly, I, I think the parable is about consequences. The sudden deaths that Jesus refers to in the beginning, how quickly they happen. There's stories in the news every week about people who suddenly, tragically, no fault of their own, a stray bullet hits somebody or they're, they're hit in a car accident that they didn't cause. We all know people who pass like that. Uh, how fragile life is. The third, the, the, the third observation here is that our choices have consequences that not everybody makes it to the kingdom of God as much as we wish they all would. That's not how Jesus lays it out. He says there's a broad way leading to death. He says those who build their house on the sand are going to face disappointing destruction. He says trees that do not bear fruit, fruit will eventually be cut down. Jesus says in verse three, I tell you, no, unless you repent, you too likewise will perish. Not talking about our physical, our, our physical life, but our spiritual life. And again, in verse five, so we didn't miss it. I tell you, no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Friends, according to Jesus, not everybody gets to heaven. So what should we do? What should we do? The word that's repeated here is the word repent. The biblical sense of the word repent is to turn back. And Jesus' great parable, the parable of the prodigal son, when the prodigal turns back, it's described in the parable as he came to his senses. He came to himself and he returns. 
and he returns seeking his father's will and, and seeking to be a servant of his father. Friends, repentance involves seeking God's will and God's ways in our life. It involves genuine confession, genuine regret, and genuinely seeking, committing not to repeat the sin again. Do you hear all three of these? Genuine confession, not necessarily to a priest, but at least to God. Genuine confession to God, genuine regret that you're sorry that, that, that you did this thing, and genuine commitment not to repeat. You know, every time we say the Lord's Prayer, we, we, we have a, a moment like this. We say, your kingdom come, your will be done. We're looking for God's will. We say, uh, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. So friends, as we move through Lent, I think it's the third Sunday of Lent, let this be a day of renewed commitment. Renewed commitment for God's will in all of our life, in all, all of our life, in every facet of our life. I invite you to look again in the program to the bulletin today. There's printed a, a unison prayer of confession. And if you all could read the dark print, I'll read the light print. But we're going to have a moment of silence as we prepare for that. And just invite the Holy Spirit to work on your heart and, and to, to uh, make it a special place where you're sitting right now, in a place of confession. Invite the Holy Spirit to work on your heart so that this might be a genuine moment, a real moment, authentic, of repentance and confession and seeking God's mercy. Let's pray together. We'll begin with a moment of silence. And let us pray. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on us. Forgive us all our sins through our Lord Jesus Christ and strengthen us in all goodness. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep us in eternal life. Amen. And if you please stand and join us as we sing our closing hymn, Rock of Ages, Clef for Me.
is a busy week, especially Tuesday. You know that you are invited to all the different events of the women to the Latane Kirkley Circle and, and the, everybody to the Exchange Club and to everybody to help if they choose to at the Augusta Gardens or the uh, community prayer meeting. Hear now the words of the benediction, an Irish benediction. May the road rise to meet you. May the wind be always at your back. May the sun shine warm upon your face. The rains fall soft upon your fields. And until we meet again, may God hold you in the palm of his hand. Amen.